Hello, and welcome to Lesson 7. So, moving right along here, our big question for this lesson is, what is the next step for the human race? And what exactly do I mean by that? Do I mean, like, evolving to a certain point um, in terms of technology, human development, etc.? This question, what I'm really getting at here, is an idea of an afterlife. If we think of the big questions, I mean the big questions, which is our connecting theme for this class. One of the things people wonder about the most is, you know, what happens to us after we die? Which, which could be another way to phrase this question. Well, like I mentioned before, the first half of the class we were focused horizontally, interacting with people around us. Here we're moving, what I would say, vertically to the bigger questions, um, not in terms of importance, but in terms of what they deal with. So in lesson six, we dwelt with, dealt with, excuse me, the problem of the nature of evil. Here we're dealing with the question of the afterlife. And then um, next lesson we'll look at, is there something greater than us, a God, some kind of divine, omnipotent being. Um, that's one of the biggest questions people ask, what slash who is God. In lesson nine, we'll talk about, kind of come back to this theme of, um, is there an afterlife? We'll come back to in lesson nine, what might it look like? Um, so the big, big questions. Again, I think we've all wondered these things at some point. And in my experiences, I've tried to answer them myself. Reading great works of literature is the, the best way to try to deal with them. And as a, as a goal for this class, you know, one of my objectives is to instill in you a passion and a love for literature. You know, it's one of those things I think people often wonder about. Why do we study this in school? Um, because it doesn't seem as, imme as immediately pragmatic as some of the other fields like math or science, for instance. You can't change a tire with a great novel, but you, you can do some other things with a great novel or a great story like try to answer these big questions. So that's what we're doing today. So after looking at evil last time, today we're looking at the afterlife. And I've picked two stories that I think really get at this question. One which is the first one we'll study, Flannery O'Connor's Revelation, which gets at it very directly. It has actual visions of what the afterlife, or at least the path there, is like. Um, the other story, which is one of my all-time favorite stories, I think it's one of the greatest literary works of the 20th century, James Baldwin's Sonny's Blues, um, doesn't ask the question directly, but it is very much a uh, question of, or a story of life and death. And so in that sense, it does ask the question. And it has, although not immediately obvious, a lot of overlap with O'Connor's revelation. One other thing before we get started, you might be wondering, why did I include a reading on um, these Bible verses which tell the story of the parable of the prodigal son? For a couple of reasons. One is uh, the Bible is an important part, an incredibly important text historically, but an important part of literary history. And so kind of like if I had, say, hypothetically left out poetry, which I addressed in the last lesson, lesson if I had left out the Bible, I would also be doing you a disservice. Because if you want a robust introduction to literature, which is the title of this course, you, we do need to read some Bible. But in, in these two stories, Revelation... And Sonny's Blues, and uniting them, because they're not stories people probably associate in their minds immediately. I'm trying to get at this question of, is there an afterlife? If there is, how do we get there? I think these two stories really address it. But to, to see how they're connected and to see how they help us try to answer that question, the, the prodigal son is kind of like a third story because it is a narrative. It's a parable. Um, is thrown in there. So we really have three examples of narrative. All of the big ones are Revelation and Sonny's Blues, and um, the Prodigal Son is more meant to be formative kind of background context, kind of informing the discussion. But with these three voices in the discussion, I think we can have a really productive discussion about the afterlife.
in all three texts are interrelated. So in part two, I'll have some possible discussion board questions that get at their interconnected relationships. Um, but I'll just say that I think the prodigal son is really there to inform our reading of Sonny's Blues, since that's a story about two brothers, <clears throat> like the prodigal son. It's about the prodigal and his older brother and their father. So um, I'm going to address that text and why I included it more so in part two of the lecture. And here I'm going to focus primarily on Revelation. So who was Flannery O'Connor? One of my favorite writers. I think uh, she has a really distinctive style um, and really you know, unique themes she tackles. But whether you like her or not, um, no one can deny that she was just a really quirky, interesting, fascinating writer. Um, her background, she lived uh, nearly her entire life in the southern part of the United States. Um, she had somewhat of a difficult life. She was diagnosed with, with lupus. There are other pictures of you, you her you've probably seen online if you Google Flannery O'Connor, where she, you know she's using some kind of crutch type uh, devices to help her walk. So she, she had kind of a difficult life medically, which is is really interesting to think about when you read her um, uh, fiction. Um, she was a devout Roman Catholic. Um, which is really interesting. I mean, obviously you can tell from reading her that she was a very religious writer, but I say it's interesting because when you read her her works, some of the themes, particularly the theme of grace, which we're going to talk about in great detail and comes up in the next bullet point, it's much more of a Protestant than a Catholic idea. So um, either way, she's, you know, a uh, very uh, openly religious writer, so that's important background to have, especially as it pertains to to need, having context to unpack her story, Revelation here. Um, and then this quote I think is particularly interesting. It used, she used to describe her own writing. She said, you know, oftentimes you have these writers who become famous. Um, they're considered authors of the great books. And when you get to the 20th century, um, we're very forward chronologically here. When you get to the 20th century, you have more of a recognition of, of literature and great literature um, and what it is, and so you have, rather than just reading people who died, you have people who, you know, were reading and studying who are still alive. Not O'Connor, but, you know, she was until not too long ago. So people did interviews and stuff with her, is my point. And a question that people like to ask, obviously, right, is what in your mind is your writing about? And so she said, it's about the action of grace in territory held largely by the devil. So she saw her writing, it's got this very gothic element, as we'll talk about, and oftentimes it deals with criminals. Um, one of her, her favorite or one of her most popular stories is called A Good Man is Hard to Find, and that's actually about a murderer, like a serial killer type, who has escaped from prison. Um, another one of her most famous stories, uh, Good Country People, is about uh, people from the country who are not not really good, actually. Um, it's about deceit, manipulation, bad parenting, and so territory held largely by the devil. It's an interesting phrase, and I think if we're talking about crime, murder, manipulation, etc., it's, it's fairly obvious. In this story, Revelation, the territory that's occupied by the devil is not as clear, um, but we're going to suss that out in the discussion. And uh, another really important thing from this quote is the action of grace. What does that mean? It's not just grace, it's grace that's active, the action of grace. Uh, grace is a concept that I don't think you see um, in every piece of literature. You know, I think it's a, a universal important theme, but not every author is willing to take it on which is, is tragic in of itself since it's such an important theme, but O'Connor does, which is one of the reasons why sh we should study her. Uh, re remembering, reevaluating what grace is and what that concept means is incredibly important, I think, in this day and age especially. And so, so O'Connor is worthwhile for the fact that she writes stories about the action of grace and territory held largely by the devil. And so in a few minutes, we get to the threads and then as we analyze the story, we'll talk about what is grace? What does that mean? And as you know, there's a character in the story named 
Mary Grace. So there you have it. Um, after the background here, I want to give you also a little bit of context. So these were things about her life, including her words that describe her own stories. What were some of the things, you know, happening around her kind of inform her story? So one is Southern Gothic. Last time we studied Faulkner and we got, you know, a real taste of Southern writing there. Um, and, and since we studied Faulkner last time, that was one of the reasons I didn't feel a need to put a disclaimer about the language in this story. We've kind of already been exposed to the Southern genre. Faulkner was writing a little bit earlier than O'Connor. So, and there's certainly some Gothic elements in his writing, as you saw, but as the Southern Renaissance period in short fiction writing progressed and developed, the text took on um, an even more Gothic tone. Um, uh, later, in like, like the 50s and whatnot, more when O'Connor was writing. Um, her writing is really marked by very dark humor. Her stories, um, not this one as much, but others are, are actually quite comical, but it's the Southern Gothic genre, so it's always like a dark humor. And then, um, of course, the um, context of the Civil War, um, just like with Faulkner. I mean, even, you know, 20, 30 years later, it's not like that uh, legacy has, has completely died out. But what you have that's interesting is there's this idea of what the culture was like in the South before the Civil War, and obviously it was marred deeply by slavery. But... Um, people in the South tried to hold on to that culture for a while, um, you know, after the Civil War ended. Um, they thought, you know, maybe that culture, even without slavery, could still exist because it wasn't, slavery wasn't the only thing that defined it, even if it was the most defining thing. Um, but what I think Faulkner and O'Connor and other writers like them do well is engage with how that pre-Civil War society is dying out um, and is almost gone. And they're not nostalgic about it like other writers were. They see the problems with that society. I think you can see that clearly in Faulkner with what we talked about last time, but also here in O'Connor with you know the fact that our main character is a racist. And again, when it comes to the language, you know, one of the first questions I'm going to ask you is is what do you think of the fact that this protagonist is not very likable, right? Um, O'Connor may have her protagonist, um, and I'm not even actually going to call Mrs. Turpin a protagonist, because um, I think a protagonist, we root for them to accomplish their goals. So I'm going to just call her Mrs. Turpin, the main character. Um, you know, my first discussion question is going to be, why would O'Connor give us a main character who's, you know, just spouting racist slurs and, is incredibly condescending and judgmental and um, arrogant and proud, etc. You know, that's a really good discussion question. But what the question itself, the fact that I'm even asking it implies, is that um, we are not meant to like Mrs. Turpin, to be sympathetic with her, not remotely. Um, so on the one hand, it's interesting that O'Connor gives us a protagonist who's not remotely sympathetic. On the other hand, it clearly shows that O'Connor is critical of this pre-Civil War culture and, and critical of the racism that was a part of it that unfortunately lasted um, at least threads of it and didn't completely die out. Um, <clears throat> so that's one very important aspect of the story we'll look at, as long as as long along with, excuse me, the dark humor, the Southern Gothic, and most importantly, the action of grace and territory held largely by the devil. So our big question is, what is the next step for the human race? And as I mentioned at the start of the lecture, what I'm really asking here, is there an afterlife? And I think if you ask, is there an afterlife, a number of sub-questions go along with it. A big one being, how do we get there? The only question people probably ask more frequently about the afterlife than how do we get there is, what is it like? And so lesson nine, which will be our last lesson with content, because in, in module 10, all you have to do is turn in your final paper. So in lesson nine, we'll, we'll ask the question, what is the afterlife like, if it exists? 
this question, this lesson we're asking, how do we get there if it exists? In, in lesson eight, we'll kind of sandwich them between those will be, does God exist or a God or something like a God exist? Um, because that's kind of the, the mediating aspect, right? What we believe about God has to do with what we believe about an afterlife or lack thereof in both cases. And so these are the three um, final questions. Basically, how do we get there? Is someone overseeing it and, and overseeing how we get there or not? And what is it like and overseeing what it is like? So that's the interconnected nature of lessons seven, eight, and nine and where, where we're going with this course. But with this lesson right now, we're going to ask, where are we going? How do we get there? If there is an afterlife, is there even one? Uh, and again, I think these questions, especially coupled, or these stories, especially coupled with the, the prodigal son, really, really help us deal with these questions. So what are some themes or threads we want to pull on, we want to look at in O'Connor? And as always, you can pause the lecture and, and review your notes and see what you identified. Um, here's what I identified. So characterization. What is the main character like? We really only have one character here who is a complex character, um, but we will talk about the significance of Mary Grace. Um, with that first question on characterization, then what we'll really ask to try to unravel that thread is, is we can establish pretty easily what Mrs. Turpin is like and how we feel about her. But with that, you know, fairly obvious answer, the bigger question is why, dear me, why would O'Connor make someone like this the main character? I think it comes back to that idea of territory held largely by the devil. Because what Mary Grace tells Mrs. Turpin is essentially you're the devil. So that's interesting to think about. But Mary Grace, her name is important, right? You, you, you don't just have a character like Mary Grace and name her Mary Grace, and that's all like superfluous. Just first name that popped into my head isn't what O'Connor was thinking, right? It's very, very intentional. So why? And moreover, to try to answer why, what is grace? Um, I think the story illustrates it. And so I, I think it's better to show rather than tell. I'll just very, you know, give you succinctly here. Um, to put it simply, grace is a Christian idea, which is that um, related to the idea that the human race is fallen and sinful, which we talked about in the last lesson a little bit as we were also connecting barn burning to religious themes. But the idea that the human race is fallen and sinful, and so what can save them, what can redeem them, what can get them to the afterlife, it's the death of um, a human person, a savior, who was not fallen and sinful. In this specific case, Jesus Christ. And um, with the idea in Christianity, the gospel, Jesus Christ dying for something he did not do, that the human race did do, um, that action you know, it's like someone else taking the punishment for us, um, someone else taking the blame for us. That then is grace. A simple way to define grace would be a free gift. So I was defining it for us in a religious context. And again, it's moreover a Protestant idea than a Catholic one, even though O'Connor was a Catholic writer or Catholic person, um, because Catholics believe in a more works-based Jesus is a part of it, but human beings do things that can atone for their sins because they have purgatory and these other things that play a role in that process. But here, um, O'Connor's really working with the idea of grace, naming one of her characters who plays a pivotal, fascinating role, grace. So so I, I've given you kind of a definition of, you know, a free gift, in this case, free gift of salvation, specifically what does Mary Grace have to do with that? We'll see in a few minutes. Obviously, one of the themes or threads has to be the title, Revelation, right? So a revelation, in, you know, in the Bible, um, working with O'Connor's context here would be, you know, God revealing something to people. Um, for instance, the last book of the Bible is called Revelation because it's, 
the revelation to John, one of the apostles, um, you know, from God, obviously giving John this vision. And so that's a little bit of context for the title of the story. And so in this story, you know, Mary Grace gives Mrs. Turpin a revelation. And Mrs. Turpin herself has several revelations or visions. Could those be, could those visions she has be revelations from God? We'll look at the quotes of two of them specifically to see. Finally, obviously, the afterlife. Um, I've framed this whole lesson around the afterlife, but even if I didn't give us any context, even if we were just diving into the story raw without a question to guide our discussion, um, the afterlife would still emerge as important because I've taught this story a number of times. And I always start with, you know, when I teach in person, I always say, you know, what themes or threads did you notice while we were reading? And I make a list of them on the board. And, and this one frequently comes up. Students identify this one pretty much every time I've taught it. Because if you're talking about Grace, if you're talking about a character who a character names Grace calls, says you're the devil, then the afterlife, how do we get there specifically, is a crucial fundamental part of the story. So let's take a look at the story and see how these out. Um, here's my first question. And as always, you can pause, give your reaction. I wish we were in the classroom so I could hear your reaction. But, you know, reading this story, this character is pretty awful. Um, so the answer to this question is, is fairly obvious. But in trying to answer it, we'll segue to a bigger, more important question. Um, and the passage I've chosen to look at here has to do with specifically... Um, one of Mrs. Turpin's vision, because this vision is one she relates to the reader um, fairly often, or fairly early in the story, but it's a dream she has fairly often. And what we'll do is we'll juxtapose this vision or revelation with the one she has at the very end of the story on the final um, close reading slide. But she says, but here the complexity of it would begin to bear in on her. For some of the people with a lot of money were common and ought to be below sheen cloth. And some of the people who had good blood had lost their money and had to rent. And then there were some colored people who owned their homes and land as well. There was a colored dentist in town who had two red Lincolns and a swimming pool and a farm with registered white face cattle on it. Usually by the time she had fallen asleep, all of the classes were mo moiling and roiling around in her head. And she would dream they were all crammed together in a boxcar, being ridden off to be put in a gas oven. Oh my, thanks, O'Connor, for this. What a passage. I wanted to quote the whole passage, but didn't want to do, do two slides. I, this story is so rich with language that I have actually five slides of quotes here, so I didn't want to you know, take it more than is necessary. But it begins with her falling asleep and kind of guiding herself to sleep by imagining all the classes of people in society. And she has a very hierarchical view of society with some people, you know, above and below others. For instance, in her mind, her value system, how she ranks people hierarchically is by the color of their skin, um, how much money or property they have, and the good works that they do. That third one isn't quite as obvious. We'll talk about it more in a minute. Um, but what's, what's, so she starts out just kind of listing the groups is why I didn't include the first half of the quote. But what's happened, what's interesting that happens as we get further along in the quote is the classes and her hierarchy start to mix together, right? Because in this place and time, African American people have been able to like earn income and raise themselves up in society. So we have people who were traditionally poor, not part, not born into the upper class. And so it's <laughs> the, the, her hierarchy is, is problematized by, you know, modern society and the people raising themselves up. And so it's not as nicely and neatly defined as she would like. And what happens when her hierarchy gets blown up by the truth that, um, people are not pigeonholed to one socioeconomic strata. She envisions all the people being ridden off to be put in a gas oven, almost as if her life would be easier 
if she didn't have to think about the fact that the classes of society are, are intermingling and her hierarchy is, is arbitrary. Now, this is kind of that pre-Civil War society dying off idea I mentioned. But it reveals a tremendous amount about her character, that she's incredibly superficial, cares the most about what people have, what they look like, and what they do. And a quote I don't have on here, but that goes along with this, is a phrase she uses all the time, which is essentially that she's very glad that she's in, that she was born, that God made her who she is, and that she's that she's not African American, that she's not poor, um, that she has some common sense are the things she says. And so, right from the get go, we are trained by O'Connor to not like this character, not be sympathetic to her. But why? What do you think is O'Connor's purpose in making this type of person, a judgmental racist, the main character? I wish I could hear your answers to that one. Don't worry, it's on the discussion. Um, so, if we're, we're, if we're given this person by O'Connor as our main character, and we're trying to figure out what to do with her, we can look at you know who she is and delve in a little bit more. So a really important aspect of her character is her religion. Um, in her mind, how do people achieve salvation? which is, is where I would, I would lead the discussion next, depending on what you all had said to the first question, right? Because this is one of the most, like, if you look at someone who's religious, there's a few questions you immediately ask. Like, what do they believe about God? What do they believe about the afterlife? How do they believe we get there? Because different people have different views, right? For instance, for a Catholic, it is, you know, human beings do good deeds, basically. And in a Protestant uh, vision, it's, you know, a sacrifice atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So, grace. Um, and then, those are just two examples. You know, numerous other religions have other views. But if a character or a person is religious, these are just naturally the first questions that come to mind. So, what does Mrs. Turpin believe? She didn't catch every word, but she caught enough to agree with the spirit of the song. So, a religious Christian song is playing on the radio in the doctor's office, and it turned her thoughts sober. To help anybody out that needed it, was her philosophy of life. She never spared herself when she found somebody in need, whether they were white or black, trash or decent. And of all she had to be thankful for, she was most thankful that this was so. So, building right on what we said last time, I said her hierarchy is based on the color of people's skin, how much uh, money or property they have, and how good of a person they are. And the third one was, you know, not as obvious. It becomes clear with this quote. And so does the idea of her being thankful for, for who God made her to be. He didn't make her um, African-American or white trash. And it's, it's interesting here. She's so judgmental and condescending. She's, she's judgmental about people who are, you know, she calls white trash. I mean, we have this narration here where it's a lot of stream of consciousness where um, O'Connor takes us inside uh, Mrs. Turpin's mind quite frequently, and we see that she literally thinks of other human beings as trash. A very important thing to know about her character. But in terms of this particular quote, um, she sees herself as someone who's very willing to help other people, even people she thinks are beneath her. Um, so she sees herself, in terms of those three categories, skin color, property slash income, good person or not. She sees herself as a very good person. She claims God made her a good person because she's willing to help other people. When we think about helping someone, truly helping someone is when there's no benefit to ourselves. Like to go back to the Christian idea of grace, that's a driving force in O'Connor's stories. That's what Jesus does on the cross, right? There's no benefit to him. Just before the crucifixion, when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Father, if there's any other way to execute your plan, please do it. I'll, I'll do your will if I have to, but if there's any other way, let's do that instead. Um, because there's no benefit to him. But here, her helping other people is entirely to her benefit. It seems to be, you know, how she believes 
uh, we get into heaven is by helping other people. That's how we get to, to the afterlife, in her view of the afterlife. And she's thankful that she's someone who helps people. She's thankful that she's a good person. Um, and I believe her hierarchy pre prevents her from, causes her, in her hierarchy, she believes that African Americans, white trash, poor people, anyone who's beneath her isn't um, capable of, of, of being a good person. You know, God didn't make them that way for that purpose. And so continues to show how just um, despicable this character is, um, but gives us a particular insight into um, what she believes about the afterlife and how we get there. So at this point in the story, we know that um, she's a judgmental racist, She's a religious, specifically Christian, or she believes she is. She, she's a, a judgmental racist who believes she's Christian and believes you get to the afterlife by being a good person. That's what we know about Mrs. Turpin through the first you know, 10 pages or so of the story. What do we learn about Mrs. Turpin once we see Mary Grace? So we have this really interesting interaction with Mary Grace where she's kind of been watching and judging her the whole time. And then Mary Grace attacks her and her husband. And after the attack, they're looking at her. And Mrs. Turpin's head cleared and her power of motion returned. She leaned forward until she was looking directly into the fierce, brilliant eyes. There was no doubt in her mind that the girl did know her. Know her in some intense and personal way. Beyond time and place and condition. What you got to say to me? She asked hoarsely and held her breath waiting as for a revelation. The girl raised her head, her gaze locked with Mrs. Turpin's. Go back to hell where you came from, you old warthog, she whispered. Her voice was low but clear. Her eyes burned for a moment as if she saw with pleasure that her message had struck its target. What is happening here? She compares this, you know, Christian woman, or supposedly Christian woman, who sees herself as a good person going to heaven, she, Mary Grace compares her with a warthog, which you're looking at the animal kingdom, right? Pigs are the dirty creatures who will eat, you know, anything. And Mary Grace tells her to go back to hell, back to hell, implying that's where she came from. Right? We just looked at a passage where Mrs. Turpin believes she's a good person. So Mrs. Turpin probably doesn't believe she's from hell. And she, she believes she's headed toward heaven, not hell. Right? Because she's, again, a good person. Um, so not only is she a war hog, you know, a beast with a cloven foot, but she's from hell. According to a character named Mary Grace. So oh, a lot going on here. And she's given... Mrs. Turpin a revelation because beforehand Mrs. Turpin would never have believed these things about herself, right? She believes she's a very good upstanding person, that God made her to be that way. He made her to be a good upstanding person. So she would never, you know, see herself this way. And that's part of why it's a revelation. But there's something intense very intense happening here. I mean, Mary Grace has attacked her and, and Mr. Turpin, so, so there's that. But there's more if you look at some of the language here. Um, she leaned forward until she was looking directly into the fierce, brilliant eyes. There was no doubt in her mind that the girl did know her, know her in some intense and personal way beyond time and place and condition. So there's a spiritual aspect here, a supernatural aspect introduced to the story by O'Connor, right? That it's beyond time and place and condition. And she's never met this girl, never interacted with her before this morning, but somehow she still knows her, not just knows her, but in an intense and personal way. What do you make of all that? Uh, in a you know Christian religion that O'Connor believed, um, people believe that you know God knows them, knows them inside and out. 
And so could Mary Grace be some kind of like angel, some kind of messenger sent from God to deliver this message? And in any case, whatever you think Mary Grace is, Mary Grace believes that her message struck its target. So wherever you believe she came from, she has a message and she delivers it. And that message is that Mrs. Turpin, um, the, the judgmental racist who believes she's going to heaven because she's a good person, is, according to this message, this revelation, in Old Warthog from hell. So what happens to Mrs. Turpin? What does she do with this message after she receives it? I am not, she said tearfully. This is later on when she's at home, like talking to herself, reflecting to herself. She's not talking to Mary Grace here. She says, I am not, she said tearfully, a warthog from hell. But the denial had no force. The girl's eyes and her words, even the tone of her voice, low but clear, directed only to her, brooked no repudiation. She had been singled out for the message. Though there was trash in the room, to whom it might justly have been applied. The full force of this fact struck her only now. There was a woman there who was neglecting her own child, but she had been overlooked. The woman had been given, the message had been given to Ruby Turpin, a respectable, hard-working, church-going woman. The tears dried. Her eyes began to burn instead with wrath. It's interesting here, Mrs. Turpin calls herself a respectable, hard-working, church-going woman. We called her, what, a judgmental racist? Uh, That's what I think she is. But um, So she has like a very different view of herself from our view of her as a reader, which is intentionally very meticulously crafted. Uh, by O'Connor and her structure of the story, right? That we, the reader, have a very different view of Mrs. Turpin than she has of herself. Um, And so, that's, you know, continuing to be part of O'Connor's critique of the Old South and of racism, etc. But but there's just so much in this quote, right? She's still, even after the revelation from Mary Grace, she's still caught up in this idea that others are beneath her. Mary Grace has not, in Mrs. Turpin's mind, leveled the playing field, right? The message was signaled out for her, even though there was trash in the room to whom it might justly have been applied, right? If someone's going to be called a warthog from hell, it's going to be the lady who was neglecting her child, right? Not a respectable, hard-working, church-going woman, right? It's going to be the mom who's neglecting her child. That's what Mrs. Turpin thinks. Um, and she's crying because the denial had no force, she can't, it's, it's a fascinating thing that happens here. If you look at the beginning and the end of this quote, because you would think if she's really so set in her ways and really has such a high view of herself that she would just be able to like reject this vision, right? Saying, no, nah, uh-uh, ain't me. But she, the denial, when she says, I'm not a warthog from hell, she said the denial had no force. That's why she's crying. So there's, there's some truth, there's some power behind what Mary Grace said that is affecting even someone like Mrs. Turpin. But the then the last words, the tears dried. Her eyes began to burn instead with wrath. So the tears dry up and her eyes, instead of being filled with tears, begin to burn with wrath. So this kind of mourning over the force of this vision that she can't deny has now become wrath, anger, She's, this is how she responds to essentially being judged um, by some kind of powerful force, a force that she perhaps recognizes as greater than herself, has judged her and rendered her unworthy because she's a, a warthog from hell. So she responds with anger. You know, she doesn't repent. She doesn't turn around. She doesn't say, oh my gosh, I've thought of people as beneath me. I am now able 
you know, I now see that there's there's good in all people. No, she doesn't she doesn't say that. Instead, she begins to burn with wrath. So I think we see here in a moment when people are confronted with their own wickedness, they're not able to just turn from that without help from a greater power. Um, and so I, I've kind of addressed this question already, but but the wrath to me is kind of the surprising turn this passage takes. And so it's interesting to meditate on why why is that where she goes with this. Um, finally, I want to end with the, the, the second vision of the afterlife. So we've had Mrs. Turpin's first vision, which is all of the social classes melting together, and that's so bad they have to, you know, be carted off to an oven. But then, and then in the middle, we have Mary Grace's vision that Mrs. Turpin is an old warthog from hell. Finally, at the end of the story, we have a second vision of the afterlife that Mrs. Turpin sees. So let's compare the two. She saw the streak as a vast swinging bridge extending upward from the earth through a field of living fire. Upon it, a vast horde of souls were tumbling toward heaven. There were whole companies of white trash, clean for the first time in their lives, in bands of African-Americans, in white robes, in battalions of freaks and lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs, and bringing up the end of the procession was a tribe of people whom she recognized at once as those who, like herself and Claude, had always had a little of everything and the given wit to use it right. She leaned forward to observe them closer. They were marching behind the others with great dignity, accountable as they had always been for good order and common sense and respectable behavior. They alone were on key. Yet she could see by their shocked and altered faces, even their virtues were being burned away. She lowered hands and gripped the rail of the hog pen, her eyes small but fixed unblinkingly on what lay ahead. In a moment, the vision faded, but she remained where she was, that being gripping the rail of the hog pen, thinking about what lay ahead for her. This is an interesting vision because you have souls tumbling toward heaven. So they're no longer heading toward an oven. They're heading, heading toward heaven. And there's people in white trash, clean for the first time in their lives. People with black skin, wrapped in robes of white. Battalions of freaks and lunatics who are leaping for joy. So people she has looked down upon, demeaned, condescended, judged, they are clothed in whiteness, clean for the first time in their lives, tumbling toward heaven. And then the people like her, they, you know, have what she would expect them to have. You know, they're the only people singing on key. Um, they're marching with great dignity, accountable, as they always had been, for good order and common sense. So she sees... People like who, her who are good in the way she thinks they're good. Respectable, dignified, hardworking, singing on key. But what's happening to them? They have shocked expressions on their faces. They're surprised. And their virtues are being burned away. So all those good works, all those good deeds they did, are being burned away as they're tumbling toward heaven. Or at least they could be tumbling toward heaven. The earlier people are. But wherever they're heading here, their faces have shocked expressions. And all their good deeds as they march toward the afterlife are being burned away. At the end, when you head toward the afterlife, the things Mrs. Turpin did that were good deeds, helping others, even though she saw beneath her, don't matter anymore. They're being burned away. Who's burning them away? God? An angel? You know, some arbiter overseer of the afterlife, they're being burned away. And she's gripping this hog pen because she can't seem to deny the force of the truth. She doesn't have the force to deny it. We saw in our last quote. So she's gripping that hog pen and her eyes, small but fixed unblinkingly on what lay ahead. What lays ahead for Mrs. Turpin? She's believed all her life she's going to heaven because she's respectable, 
dignified, good, above others in, in her mind. But she's been told by Mary Grace that she's an old warthog from hell. So where is she headed next? And where are these other people headed? They're tumbling toward heaven, not toward a gas oven. And they have been made clean, even though, in Mrs. Turpin's mind, they haven't done the things she believes they need to do to get to heaven. They're headed there anyway, and they're clothed in robes of whiteness. And this is the vision she has, gripping the hog pen, after, after Mary Grace has told her she's an old warthog from hell. It's a powerful message. It's a powerful vision. And it's, I think, a really, you know, beautiful critique of, of racism, of pride, of classism, of of not believing we can see the good or find the good in other people. And it, it's a beautiful vision of that what matters is what's on the inside, what's in our hearts, not the actions that we do. So after seeing this vision and reading this story, what are some questions that can take us even deeper? Rather, what are some questions that you can use to take me deeper by answering them? Of course, what do you think of O'Connor's choice to make a judgmental racist the main character of her story? Why not give us Captain America? Why not give us a protagonist we really want to root for? Um, what might be O'Connor's purpose? What might she be trying to do? And, and, and really, an interesting thing, I think, to think about is, is, is what is your reaction to this? Even if there's some great message behind this choice, how does it affect the reading experience? Would you rather read or enjoy reading something more that has a likable protagonist? Or is the message powerful enough here that um, we really get something out of and even in a way maybe even enjoy, bizarrely, this kind of reading experience? So that's Mrs. Turpin. Further pulling on the thread of characterization, consider Mary Grace's name. What, after hearing this lecture and reading this story, what do you think the word grace means? Define it in your own words. Why do you think O'Connor gave this character this name? How does Mary Grace's name influence our interpretation of her revelation to Mrs. Turpin? When she says, you know, you're an old warthog, you should go back to hell. What does it mean that a message comes from Mary Grace? And what does the concept of grace mean? You know, I tried to kind of explain it, but I think uh, better than anything I could say is, is showing rather than telling. And O'Connor doesn't tell us what grace means, but she shows us what it means in that final vision. Um, and let's, let's, we haven't really dwelt on the hawk aspect of the vision, the revelation much, so we could. Um, what are the symbolic significance of hogs throughout the entire story? What do they represent? Why is Mrs. Turpin an old warthog? What's significant about this comparison? I mean, she's grabbing the, the hog pen at the end of the story there. So, um, hogs are clearly, you know, very important. Um, finally, you've got this um, question you probably expected about. Let's juxtapose the two visions, right? Um, juxtapose Mrs. Turpin's recurring dream of her hierarchy of people of various races and classes being carted into an oven, juxtapose that with her a final vision of all these same types of people going to heaven. Why is the vision different of the trip to the afterlife? Why is the vision of that different at the end of the story? What's significant about the differences between these two visions? And what is ultimately O'Connor's message about the afterlife? And I think it's really good for us in this class to meditate just on, not on what the story is about, but since we're asking these big questions, how do they make us think, reflect on our own beliefs and values? So, um, you know, do you agree? Like, like, what is the contrast these two visions tell us about what O'Connor th thinks of the afterlife? And, you know, do you agree? Why or why not? This one I'm particularly interested in reading your post because of how this story makes us think.